Hey Facebook, it's Father Chris. I'm currently in a place called Muskoka Woods. Uh, in Muskoka Woods, we are having the opportunity to teach our grade 8 students what leadership is all about. So they got all these fun opportunities to challenge themselves, encourage each other. Uh, with them, we have a bunch of high school students that will be leading them. So I just ask you uh, for this week if you could say some prayers for them. Uh, I also wanted to give you a theological reflection today, or maybe it's a bit more philosophical on a common phrase that we've heard many, many times, but is often um, perhaps not discussed enough that we can critically examine it. And that is the phrase, uh, you know, love the sinner, but hate the sin. Um, and that's, of course, applied to every sin and every sinner. So it's not just on one particular issue. Uh, one of the reasons why I think this is important is because it will help us understand how not to hate our enemies, because that is definitely one of Christ's uh, challenges to us. And I find that today, uh, generally speaking, there's a real challenge to be able to foster that uh, ability within ourselves. So what does that mean? What does it mean to hate the sin and to love the sinner? Uh, I want to begin by making a distinction between two things. One is called the moral character of a person, and the second is the nature of a person. So these are two different things, and they're very philosophical. Okay, So the moral character of a person is what do they do regularly? What are their habits? Are they good? Are they bad? Are they virtuous? Are they vicious? Um, and so the moral character of a person can be, if you could say, Put on some sort of scale if a person is constantly ripping people to shreds constantly being rude uh, narcissistic whatever you would say they don't have a good moral character um, if a person is saintly is acting heroically um, is constantly putting others before themselves out of love for the for the other they would be said to have a good moral character and so moral character is based on decisions that we as human beings make um, and they're based on not just one decision so you can't just do one good thing and then all of a sudden have a good moral character uh, but they're based on the overall approach of it the way that uh, Aristotle said it when he talked about virtue was he said that uh, you don't have a good habit just because you do something once vice versa you don't have a bad habit just because you've done something bad uh, once okay so moral character is something that we can um, say in, in someone that that's not good you don't have a good moral character okay and that would be um, disliking the sinfulness of that person uh, but at the same time it would not mean that you'd be disliking them personally now this is I think something that we have a hard time with because we often think of our identity comes from a our lifestyle be our beliefs or see uh, the decisions that we've made in the past or will make in the future. That's actually not the case. So let's dial back to the wonderful philosopher Aristotle, who said this one very simple phrase, which is action flows from being. Okay, so this whole idea that my nature or my being is what gives rise to what I'm able to do, good or bad. Okay. And so that's what we would call as our nature, okay? So our nature gives us this potential, this free will to do good or to do evil. And this nature is not neutral. It's actually good. Our nature is good. Uh, from a theological point of view, we would say our nature is good, but it's fallen. And so um, there's a need for healing in it, but it's ultimately at its most basic and fundamental level, it was created for something good. So this is what, as Catholics, we're saying you can never hate. You can never hate a person's nature. Um, you can dislike and, and hate their moral character if it's evil, but you cannot ever hate their nature. And here's where the hatred actually becomes a form of love for the person's nature. Okay, So if a person is doing something evil, what we could say is, well, that evil, that bad moral character doesn't line up with the actual nature of that person. It's contrary to their nature. So we hear the phrases sometimes, uh, that's inhumane, right? Um, uh, that's a great expression to describe sin. 
because when we are sinning, we're falling short of what it means to be human. And so there's this notion of uh, a person acting in a way that's inhumane. But what we're not saying is that they've stopped being human. You see where I'm going with that. And so sometimes one of the tools that people would use to fight wars or to look at their enemies in a certain way is they would uh, dehumanize them purposefully so that in their mind, they would be able to not look at them as a person with a good nature. They would actually be able to say, this is just a beast. Now I know Jesus even called King Herod a fox, right? But I think we have to be honest with ourselves that when he did that, he wasn't really speaking about his nature. He was speaking about maybe his moral character instead. And so we don't want to dehumanize people on the natural level. But we might say that their behavior resembles that of beasts, which is in fact something that many saints have done. Uh, they have spoken about the danger of treating ourselves uh, less than uh, a human being, which is to revert back to maybe something inferior like a dog or a cat. And we kind of do see that in our world today. We see that with euthanasia. We see that with uh, hysterectomies that are, are done not because of medical reasons, but because of a lack of self-control um, and so on and so forth. So we see this uh, popping up in a number of different ways. And ultimately, it's because we're losing a sense of who we really are. So whenever we have to uh, enter into a discussion with someone, um, I think it's important for us to understand that we're actually condemning a, an evil moral character in someone because uh, that uh, bad moral character is preventing this person from fulfilling their own potential. Uh, and it's also, it's not just in regard to them, but it's also in regard to the whole common good of society so that their behavior is so important and it affects everybody. And so we have to condemn it not just for their own good, but for the health of society because what they do and the attitudes they have intrinsically affect all of us in the community. And third of all, we have to condemn it because it's offensive to God, which is, of course, the most important reason to condemn anything that's morally reprehensible. So in the process of looking at these things, I, I think we don't really think about that when we hear condemn the sin, um, but love the sinner. I think sometimes what people might be tempted to hear is, well, if you want to be angry at something, just spend a lot of time condemning the action and the behavior. Uh, but why are we condemning the action and behavior? Well, because we love that person. We love the way that they're uh, created, their design, their nature, and so on. And that's the last thing I want to address is this whole reality of our nature and our being. It has a, a design to it, a definition to it. And it's not up to us to determine what that nature is. So in philosophy, we call this teleology. So when I look at my body, even if it's the result of evolution, uh, nonetheless, it is a fact that these eyes are for seeing. And that's not me existentially deciding what I'm going to use my eyes for. Likewise, my tongue is used for tasting, for talking, for swallowing. All those things are there so that um, I can survive and live and communicate and talk. My ears are for hearing. Um, and, and so these are things that we discover that exists within us and they have a purpose, a meaning to them, okay? And when we uh, look at the whole human person, what motivates us uh, psychologically and so on, we know that we're created for justice, for love, for truth. And so, of course, these are all good, wonderful things. And uh, we're also created for pleasure. God actually makes virtue pleasurable to us when we're doing the good. Uh, we experience that. Uh, on a regular basis. So when we look at the human person, what we can say is we're created for something good. And that goodness never departs from us. Now let's go to a theological conundrum because uh, let's say hypothetically a soul is in hell. Okay, We know Jesus has spoken about that many times. Uh, he said there will be gnashing of teeth. So, so these souls in hell, whoever they might be, the question is, is, is their nature now evil? Are we now allowed to hate both the sinner and the sin? And the answer is no. We, we still can't because their nature is good. And if their nature was not good, 
philosophically, they probably just wouldn't exist. Uh, but secondly, uh, the only reason why they suffer in hell is because their nature is still good. So their nature longs for love, their nature longs for truth, and yet their will, their moral character, holds on to the false truths, to the lies, to the deception, to the malice, to the narcissism. And because their will is holding on to something evil, it stands in contradiction with their nature. And therefore, that dissonance, that contradiction between what they're choosing and what their nature is, the fulfillment of their potential as designated by their nature, that contradiction or dissonance actually is what creates the suffering that they experience in hell. By the way, that wasn't a little violin for them. Okay, no crocodile tears here. But what I'm saying, brothers and sisters, is that that actual dissonance that exists within any soul that is what actually causes the suffering. So the reason for their suffering is uh, ultimately because of what they've chosen. So think of uh, Lazarus and the rich man, the parable Jesus gives us. So this man, this rich man who's lost his sense of identity, he's wrapped up not in his good nature, but in his money, he's in hell. And the first thing that he does when he's speaking to Abraham is he basically says to him, uh, you know, get Lazarus to dip his hand in water and cool my tongue. Well, this is a very telling statement because for most of his life, uh, this rich man has treated Lazarus like garbage, basically like a servant. And the first thing that he does in hell is the same bloody thing. He asks this Lazarus to serve him, to subordinate himself in service of him. In other words, Lazarus regrets being in hell, but he doesn't regret why he's there. He doesn't regret the behavior and the actions that he's been clinging on to. And so even in hell, he continues to cling on to his sin. And that's what we would say is the concretization or the immortalization of the moral character. So when we die, um, whatever moral character we have, with the exception of clinging on to venial sins, um, if we die with mortal sin, we die forever holding on to them. It's kind of like our will has atrophied around what we're choosing. And so we can't actually change our will. We can't change our mind. And so Christ explains this by saying that there is this infinite chasm between heaven and hell. And so you can see why all of a sudden we are hating a moral character. Because we don't want someone to cling to something for eternity. Because it's going to cause them nothing but anxiety and distress for all eternity. And we want to save people from that. Jesus himself wants to do that. So I think it's very important for us to understand that when we're contradicting a person's behavior and actions, it's not an excuse or enabling act for us to hate them, but in fact has to be springing out of our love for the, their good nature uh, as a member of society, as a, as a person created in the image and likeness of God, and for their own sake, for their own happiness. So the next time you're frustrated with someone, whoever it might be, I want you to go through a mental exercise in your head where you're able to try to allow yourself to say, help me to hate what they've done, but not just because it irritates me, not because they just don't agree with me and I feel alone, feel isolated with that, but try to um, regret what they've done and hate what they've done because you know it's not going to bring them ultimately happiness and love and that it's not good for all of us around us and it dishonors God. If you can do that, that hatred of a moral character actually springs from love. One of the things my spiritual director, Father Al uh, Amomni, always says to me is, you know, we have to learn to hate what Christ hates from the cross, but to love what Christ loves for, from the cross. And he loves all of us. He wants to uh, renew us. He wants to heal us. Uh, but he hates what uh, misery and evil that we've created out of our own free will. And so, brothers and sisters, I just wanted to offer you that reflection, but really meditate deeply on this whole nature to the human person, because that is created by God, and we do not have the right to hate it. God bless you.